Okay, well, let's get started. Uh, my name is Don Barnetson. I'm a VP of products at Credo. I think many of you may know Credo. Uh, Credo is at our core a Certies company, uh, but we've taken those Certies and we built lots of amazing things with them. We built retimers, we built gearboxes, we built optical DSPs. Um, as you learned yesterday, we're building PCI Express retimers and CXL retimers, and we build active electrical cables, which is really what I'm here to talk about today. Um, the biggest change that's happened in uh, our industry, certainly since I've joined, is the very rapid adoption of liquid cooling in AIML systems. I'd like to talk about the impact of that to back-end network design. A uh, little message from our legal department. So let me get you the high-level summary. An AL AI ML network requires three independent networks to work well. So there's a front end network. The front end network is how data gets in and out of the system, whether you're training or you're doing inference. That front end network typically runs a TCP protocol. It's relatively low bandwidth. It's effectively the same network that general compute ran on, and it's extremely robust. It runs across the entire data center. The second network is a scale out network. So this is the network where everybody's focused today. This is the massive amount of connectivity that we're getting inside of the data center to allow us to train or infer across large numbers of GPUs across many racks or perhaps many rows. This supports pipeline parallel um, operation. It uses ethernet UDP traffic for the vast majority of, of the space and there's a few folks who still use InfiniBand. Um, this spans across the entire data center as well. The third network that you don't hear so much about yet is the scale up network. This is much, much faster. Um, this supports tensor parallel operation that I'll talk about briefly. All of these scale up networks that are proposed right now run on layer one ethernet. So they're all going to run on layer one ethernet and then they'll have various proprietary extensions at layer two and above. The point is that they will be extremely sensitive to both packet loss and jitter as we'll talk about briefly. Liquid cold plate cooling has increased density so impressively. Um, if you come to our, um, our Innovation Center uh, demo, you can see there's an order of magnitude increase in density in just three years. What that actually does is it decreases space by an order of magnitude. That allows us to do things that previously we had to do in optics, it allows us to do them in copper. Copper is a much better medium where it works to move this amount of data. It's lower cost, it's much more reliable, and it's much less expensive. So it creates opportunities to do these networks in copper. So we like to think of these for simplicity as the 1x, 10x, and 100x networks, because otherwise there's a lot of words to remember. The front end network is about 100 gigabits per CPU. The scale out network is about a terabit or 800 gigabits per CPU. And that scale up network is about another order of magnitude faster yet. So the future is indeed very exciting. So let's talk about what these mean. So I have a very simplified drawing here of four GPUs trying to work on a model together. So the way that you train that model is you take your data set and you break it into pieces. You shard it into pieces and then you feed it into the network through the front end network. Or you feed it into the GPUs through the front end network. So that front end network, as I mentioned, it's our 1x network. It uses TCP, which is a very, very robust protocol, very highly resilient, but this is our relatively simple network. When you want to put more than one GPU on it, the simplest thing to do is to do pipeline parallelism. Much like we do in processors, you basically string a bunch of GPUs in series, each one of them works on a portion of the model, and the way that they trade data back and forth is using Ethernet UDP. So they do RDMA into each other's memory using a UDP protocol. UDP is not as robust as TCP because it doesn't wait to get the packet acknowledged, it just sort of sends it and hopes that it gets there. And so these networks suddenly become extremely sensitive to packet loss and link sensitivity. There's no recovery in the network. And indeed, actually, as you'll see in a moment, a single link loss can cause a model to crash out of its training run. When you want to add yet more GPUs in parallel, you then have to start to break it into rows. And so rows is more complicated. That's tensor parallel operation, which is what the scale up or the 100x network is for. So there you're actually seeing that kind of horizontal break and you're seeing the individual tensors cross that. It creates a very high level of dependency across this network and it means you have to have an extremely high bandwidth but also extremely low latency and lossless network to connect it. So those protocols today are proprietary. They run on top of layer one ethernet but they're NVLink, UA link, and perhaps in the past PCI Express. So optics have been around for a long time. The optics that we use today were designed for front-end networks. So a front-end network, here's a picture of a Microsoft Azure front-end network, is a traditional maybe three-layer CLO network. 
where you're using a resilient protocol like TCP, and you're also building a massively redundant network and then sending traffic across that through a protocol like ECMP, which is able to spray the, the packets across this. Packet loss and link flap is generally non-observable to customers in this space because you have so much redundancy built into the network and you have it built into the protocol. Um, occasionally, host to T0 issues have been an issue in the past, but most of the hyperscalers have moved to a dual Tor structure now, either with our switch AEC or other implementations, so they're effectively redundant top to bottom in this network. Failovers can happen without the end customer even being aware of it. But when we get into a back-end network, we now no longer have this redundancy. So optics become critical path. So this is a, a picture of an NVIDIA network, but they're similar across the uh, industry. That back-end network, that 10x network, uses a non-resilient protocol, uh, UDP, and then it puts optics in a non-redundant T0 layer. So there's effectively only one connection from that GPU up to that first switch. And so if that connection gets interrupted even briefly, that GPU is offline. If that GPU is offline and you're training, then your model can't move forward and the model has to stop, kick that GPU out of the pool, restart with another GPU from spares and lose a bunch of productivity. That is really, really expensive. So the data centers that folks are starting to build out today are in the 100, 128,000 GPU space. GPUs today are renting out at about $4 per GPU per hour. If you lose 30 minutes of productivity, you're talking about a $200,000 event in your $5 billion data center. That's a really substantial event for something that we used to just be able to ignore that happens actually pretty frequently in this space. It becomes really important. It also really upsets end customers because they're trying to get through training of their models. And I think if you talk to major AI providers, they're actually only getting you know, 50 to 80% uptime in their data centers. So this front-end network focus, we really focused on hardware failures and optics because hardware failures actually caused a problem. If the transceiver dies, then somebody's gotta go replace it and that's offline. So we focused on mean time between failures. So optics traditionally have a mean time between failures of one to 10 million hours, largely dominated by the laser reliability. Lasers tended to be the point of failure in optics in the past. Credo's AECs um, don't have lasers in them. Our active electrical cables have a mean time between failure of about 100 million hours, simply because we don't have lasers and we've intentionally designed much higher reliability components into these because we know that that first layer is non-redundant and we know that there's an opportunity to do better. But this, this, this feature of link flap, this is sort of a, a new thing that we haven't really talked about in the past, this momentary, inter, inter, uh, interrupt, or sorry, momentary interruption of optics, um, which requires the host to reset it, and maybe it goes down for 30 or 60 seconds. This is not something we talked about. We need to define a new figure of merit. So a new figure of merit here is mean time to link flap. How often does an optics link flap? And it turns out it actually happens pretty often. It turns out it happens every 30 to 300,000 hours which sounds like a lot of time until you put 100,000 of these optics in your data center and then it's happening every three hours. So it does vary by vendor and by optics type. Uh, what we've seen uh, anecdotally is Vixels tend to be much worse than various single mode solutions, but it exists across the entire industry. And it's about 100x worse than the hardware failure rate of these optics. Or maybe put another way, you can expect an optic to flap about 100 times before it fails on average. Credo's AECs don't have link flap. So our AECs, we have six billion field power on hours of Credo's AEC operation. We have no reported link flap at all in the space. We don't have any unexplained events. So that gives us a mean time to link flap that's a thousand times better than optics. But a really important question is why do optics flap? And I'm gonna tell you something honestly, we don't really know. You know, Credo makes DSPs, we understand how our DSPs work, but there are other DSPs in the market that are behaving in a way that we don't fully understand, and it's a very active research topic across the hyperscale space. It's something that we will spend a lot of time on, I'm sure many other folks will as well. So if I take an example of a relatively small cluster, a 16,000 GPU cluster, such as what trained uh, Meta's Lama 3, perhaps uh, some of you have read Meta's paper, which was excellent, by the way. Um, at 150,000 hours mean time to link flap, we would predict that you might have a link flap in that cluster every 10 days. But actually, if you look at Meta's data, they had 35 unexplained network events in 54 days. They were getting a network event every two days in their cluster, which suggests perhaps not all of those were link flap, but it suggests that actually optics reliability might be worse than what we would predict in this. 
So what happens when you take that and you scale it to 100,000 GPUs or 200,000 GPUs? You know, this event compounds on itself. You don't have redundancy built into this structure because you can't afford it. Each GPU is doing its own task in that data center and they're all depending on each other. We can't have a system where there's a link event every 1.5 hours. Fortunately, liquid cool gives us an opportunity to do something different. In the past, rack densities used to be really low. We were building 10 kilowatt air-cooled racks, which meant an entire row or multiple rows were connected to one switch rack in the center, and there was no choice but to use optics to do this. So you might have a, a 20 meter link in this air-cooled system uh, that you see above. In that liquid-cooled system, that, that 20 meter space collapses down to five or seven meters. And so now we have an opportunity to do this in copper. And copper is awesome for a bunch of reasons. Our active electrical cables are much more reliable, as we've talked about from a hardware standpoint, enormously more reliable in a meantime to link flap standpoint. They're lower cost. They save $1,000 per GPU. And I know GPUs are expensive, but $1,000 is real money. And they're lower power. They save up to 14 watts per GPU. And so we can actually now build pods, you can think of them, that are maybe comprised of only five or seven racks, and we can do all of the interconnectivity in those pods within copper which is really, really exciting for us and some of our early lead customers on this space. So to that end, um, just last Thursday, we launched our 800 gig zero flap AECs. So these are 800 gig AECs that reach up to seven meters in length, specifically designed for that host to rail connectivity. We'll support both 400 gig and 800 gig NICs. 400 gig NICs are what are shipping today. We look forward to 800 gig NICs becoming available soon. The 400 gig NICs are based on a Y cable, so we take an 800 gig switch port and we break it into two NIC ports. The 800 gig NICs will take a straight cable, and so they'll consume twice as many switch ports, but that's super exciting. That's even more bandwidth for us to consume. These will have best in class performance, 10 watt power for 800 gig N, five watts for 400 gig, 100 million hour MTBF, the zero flap design for the highest level of confidence in the stability of these networks, and our very, very well known purple mesh jacket. Um, these products are available today, and I encourage you to come by at the Credo booth or the Innovation Village to see them live. We were very excited to get the support of X.AI when we launched these. If you take a look at our press release, they're, uh, they're very supportive and indicated that this is the foundation they plan to build their data centers upon. So nothing's easy. Um, copper actually does take real space. And so if you're going to design a, uh, a system that uses copper, even across three or five racks, copper takes a lot more bulk than optics, and you really do need to think about co-designing rack elevations with the interconnect that you're building. And so this is something we have a lot of experience doing and helping our customers with. In fact, we're embedded in our customers doing this today. You need to think about various ways you can route. Are you going to route in the tray? Are you going to route under a raised floor? Or are you going to route across a face panel? And if you're going to route across a face panel, how are you going to leave space to do that? And then how does that interact with your DevOps team who needs to maintain this system? Well, Credo invented this category of AECs. It's been designing these rack elevations for six years. We help our customers do this every single day. And it's the reason that we build all the mock-ups that you see both in the Credo booth, in the Innovation Village, and if you have a chance at our office uh, in San Jose. But I'd say in this space, the fun is really just beginning. Um, we talked about those three networks. We've got the front-end network, the 1x network. We've got the back-end scale-out network, the 10x network. Wait until we start routing the 100x scale-up network. There's a whole other network coming that's gonna be an order of magnitude denser that really wants to blow out of the rack scale that it's in today to enable massive parallelism at row scale. We're gonna to have to route about 10 times more signal than we've been routing in the past, and I think that's a super exciting challenge for us to take on. So here's my call to action. Back-end networks really need to be more reliable than front-end networks. We can't just do things the way we always have. We need a lower mean time to link flap. Liquid cooling allows us to use a different system. So we can go from optical to copper because the space has been so dramatically reduced. And the value proposition is really strong. Better reliability, lower power, and massive cost savings right up front. We're delivering these solutions now and are scale up ready. And so maybe an open question for folks in the OCP community is should we really think of an OCP sub-project to build a standard reference architecture here? We have reference architectures for so many things, but often they're not coming fast enough for our customers to use them, so many customers are having to bushwhack their way through this. I think we can do better than that. There's additional information online. Uh, Credo's AC, uh, AECs are an OCP certified product, and we look forward to working with you. I'm, thank you so much for your time. I'm very happy to take some questions.
All right, well, if anyone is shy, please find me either in the Credo booth or at Innovation Village. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your show.